In the previous video, we looked at the molecular geometry and the electron geometry of two molecules, HCN and AlCl3. And I've summarized all of the information from that video in this area right here. The number of areas of electrons around the central atom for each molecule, the bond angle that allows those bonds to get as far apart from each other as possible, and the name that we give to the geometry, both molecular and electron, for both of these types of molecules. We're now going to continue doing the same thing for three additional molecules. We'll be starting with CH2F2. So first we're going to fill in the number of areas of electrons for this molecule. And if you recall, to do that we focus on the central atom, which is carbon. We ignore all of the outer atoms. And then we just ask ourselves how many areas of electrons are around that central carbon atom. These areas of electrons could either be bonds or they could be lone pairs. This carbon atom has four areas of electrons around it. We now want to ask ourselves what is the largest possible bond angle or angle between any two single bonds in this molecule that would allow these negatively charged electrons to spread as far apart as possible. The way this molecule is drawn, it appears as though this angle is 90 degrees. And if the molecule were required to be flat, to stay in, in one flat plane, it is true that this angle would be 90 degrees. But because this molecule is able to spread out in three dimensions, we can actually get those um, bonds to be a little bit further apart. So what we're going to do is go back to mole view. We're going to take a look at this particular molecule, CH2F2. In this, I already have it um, drawn in mole view. In this representation, the gray in the center is the carbon atom, and the green are the fluorine atoms, and the white is the hydrogen atom. And the way I have the three-dimensional um, model shown right now, it does look like we have a 90-degree angle between the bonds, all the bonds in this molecule. But as I rotate it, you will see that this molecule is not flat, so the bond angle is in fact not 90. It's not stuck in a flat shape. It does have this interesting three-dimensional shape to it. And this particular shape has a bond angle of 109.5. That's kind of difficult to gauge when you're just looking at the model. Um, so you will maybe just have to kind of take my word for it that the bond angle is 109.5 in this molecule. It's just a little bit larger than 90 degrees. The name that chemists give to this particular type of shape or geometry is called tetrahedral. And if you recall, the only difference between molecular geometry and electron geometry has to do with whether or not the molecule has lone pairs on the central atom. We haven't encountered any examples of that yet in any of these videos. It, they, we will in a future video. But when there are no lone pairs on the central atom, like in this case and all of the examples we've seen so far, the molecular geometry and electron geometry have the same name. So the last thing that we want to do with this molecule, which is something that we did not do in the previous video, is come up with a way to draw this particular shape that shows the actual three-dimensional positioning of the atoms in this particular molecule. For the previous molecules that we looked at in the last video, these molecules were planar, they were flat, they didn't have three dimensions to them. So the way that we draw them in their Lewis structure is an accurate representation of their three dimension shape. But for this particular molecule, the way that we draw the Lewis structure, it implies that we have 90 degree bond angles and that the molecule is flat. We can see that it is not. So the way chemists traditionally draw a molecule that is tetrahedral is that we pick um, two atoms, in this case I'm going to pick the hydrogen atoms, and we put those two hydrogen atoms in the same plane as the central atom. So what I'm doing, I'm angling this to show you that I'm trying to line the carbon atom up with the two hydrogen atoms, maybe like this, you can see, that, so they're all linear with respect to each other, these atoms right here. And we hold the molecule so that the hydrogen atom, the carbon atom, and the other hydrogen atom are all flat. Like if you laid them down on your desk, they would just be sitting there flat. When we hold the molecule in this particular shape, you can see that we have one fluorine atom that is sticking up at us. 
And then we have that other fluorine atom that's down here in the back, kind of hiding. So the way that we draw that particular shape is to draw the carbon atom and the hydrogen atoms that are parallel to the paper or parallel to the desk. We draw them with uh, normal standard bonds. And notice that I'm drawing them with an angle that is reflective of the angle that we see in mole view. For the fluorine atom that is kind of sticking out in front, sort of pointing towards us, we draw that particular bond on a thicker bond, which we call a wedge bond. And that fluorine atom that's hiding in the back, we draw that particular bond on what we call a dash. So that's a dash bond right there. And again, I'm trying to angle all of these bonds to reflect the way that I'm positioning the molecule in mole view. Um, and this is what I've done here is very standard notation to represent the tetrahedral shape. Two straight bonds, one wedge bond, and one dash bond. Let's continue on with looking at our other two molecules. So we have our next molecule, PCl5, phosphorus pentachloride. When we look at the central atom, we can see that we have five areas of electrons, five bonds around the phosphorus atom. And we're going to need to go back to mole view again to figure out what the bond angle is for this particular molecule. So let's, let's bring that back. And I'm going to put the phosphorus in the center. One of the really nice things about mole view is that you really don't have to initially make it look pretty at all because it does a good job of cleaning that structure up for you. Remember that this is a software that's available to anybody. So I encourage you to just access it. You don't have to download anything. You just access it directly from the internet in your browser and you can build whatever molecules you would like. So here's the PCL5 molecule and you can see it's an interesting shape. There are two chlorine atoms. Right now I'm trying to kind of eclipse them. There are these two chlorine atoms that are kind of linear, like the chlorine, the, the green chlorine to the orange phosphorus to the other green chlorine makes like a nice linear shape. And then the other three chlorine atoms are sticking out in the center in kind of a trigonal planar shape. And so it's almost like it has an axis with that top and bottom chlorine, and those three chlorine atoms kind of move around it. This particular ge geometry actually has two different bond angles to it. If we look at it from this perspective, you can see that there is a 120 degree bond angle between the phosphorus atoms and, uh, the, excuse me, the, the chlorine phosphorus bonds, so 120 degree bond angle. If you look at it from this perspective, no matter how we turn it around, so it's not an optical illusion, there is a 90 degree bond angle. There's a really good view of that 90 degree bond angle. So we have two different bond angles in this particular geometry, which is slightly unique. This particular geometry, molecular geometry as well as electron geometry, is called trigonal bipyramidal. Trigonal bipyramidal. So the name implies that there are two pyramid shapes that have a triangle base. And when I look at, when I hold it this way, you can see there's the triangle base. And then when I turn it up this way, if you can imagine the chlorine on the top and the bottom sort of being points of the pyramid, we have one pyramid sticking up and one pyramid sticking down. And again, when we have no lone pairs on the central atom, the geometry for the uh, molecular geometry as well as the electron geometry are identical. So how can we draw this three-dimensionally? Again, it's standard with chemists to pick a few bonds to hold them in the plane of the paper. And so for this particular molecule, I'm gonna put the phosphorus, which is in the center, in the plane of the paper, and the chlorine atoms that are on the top and the bottom, the ones that I'm kind of eclipsing right now, we'll have those be in the plane of the paper as well, and those ones are always drawn with a straight line. The chlorine atom that is sticking off to the left, that one is also going to be in the plane of the paper. So all of those have straight line bonds to indicate that they are all in the same parallel plane. 
When we hold it in this configuration, we can see that we have one chlorine atom that is kind of sticking up at us, and that's the one that we put on the wedge shape. And then we have that other chlorine atom that's hiding in the back, and that's the one that goes onto the dashed shape. And so this would be the three-dimensional drawing for a trigonal bipyramidal molecule. We have one molecule left, and that is SF6, sulfur hexafluoride. So starting with areas of electrons, when we just focus on the sulfur, how many areas of electrons or how many bonds do we have on that sulfur? We can see that there are six bonds on that sulfur atom. Let's go ahead over here and come up with a model of this molecule. So we have our sulfur in the middle, and we're going to put the six fluorine atoms around it. And then we'll go ahead and convert that into a three-dimensional drawing. And here we have it. And when I zoom right in, it almost looks like there's only four fluorines, but there are the other two kind of hiding in the back. So we're, first thing that we're looking for is what are the bond angles? If we look at it from this perspective, those are some nice 90 degree bond angles right there. We can see those 90 degree bond angles. And if we look at it, let's say from this perspective, there's some more 90 degree bonds. And in fact, any way that we turn this molecule, all that we're going to see are 90 degree angles. So every position that we turn this in, we're gonna end up with 90 degree angles. And again, I do encourage you to go to this website and build these models yourself so that you can control the rotation of these, of these molecules and kind of visualize the shapes for yourself. But the only angle in this particular molecule is a 90 degree angle. This particular geometry is called octahedral. It is octahedral molecular geometry as well as octahedral electron geometry. In the next video, we're actually going to have an opportunity to look at molecules that are different in terms of their molecular geometry and electron geometry. Now, last but not least, in, in terms of drawing this molecule three-dimensionally, there are a couple of different ways in which chemists choose to draw the octahedral geometry. The way that I like to do it is to set the molecule up so that the top and bottom fluorine in this particular case are all in a straight line like this. So I want my sulfur and my top and bottom fluorine to all be in a nice straight line. And I'll draw those ones first. And when I do this, I can see that I have two fluorine atoms that are sticking up at me. One of them is to the left and the other is to the right. And those are going to be on these thick wedgie bonds. So I have a fluorine sticking up to the left and also to the right. And then in the back, I've got those two fluorines hiding, one to the left and one to the right. And so these are now this, um, this whole page of notes. This summarizes for all areas of electron density that we'll encounter in general chemistry, when there are no lone pairs at all on the central atom, here's a good reference of all of the bond angles, the names of the molecular and electron geometry, and all of the ways in which we would represent these molecules three-dimensionally.